Well, come on, come on, come on, come on. This is Andy C. Luter, and uh, in just a few minutes, we'll be starting this uh, mini webinar on church history. I want to wait just a moment or two more. We've had a number of people uh, to sign up for this particular time slot, and I want to give them ample opportunity to come and to join us. If you're here and you're anticipating this mini webinar, let me thank you for taking the time signing up, giving me this opportunity to share with you uh, material that I am extraordinarily passionate about. There is an old saying that goes, you can't know where you're going until you know where you have been. The church has been around for some 2,000 years, and unfortunately, oftentimes we do not take the time to investigate or examine where we have come from. Now, the overall objective of this exercise and this webinar is to introduce to you, to give you a glimpse, even an exposure to the wonderful world of history as it relates to the New Testament church. Now, let me be quite honest. I will be spending the next several minutes with you, but there is no way even within the confines of the time that I'm taking today to share this webinar with you that I can cover comprehensively all of the details of church history over the last 2,000 years. My hope is to literally whet your appetite and hopefully uh, encourage you to do more investigation, to do more research, to do more study on your own. I am giving you the major highlights of history and it is admittedly perhaps from somewhat of a Eurocentric point of view or that of Western civilization. And I say that only to acknowledge that while the events that I will be describing in this webinar were indeed going on, there were a multiplicity of other events that were going on in places like Africa and Asia and the Far East. And this webinar is not intended to exclude or to minimize the immensity of history that was taking place in other parts of the world. I am following a timeline that is strongly related to Western civilization, which is where most of us reside in. Having said that, let me also say that uh, this has always been a passion of mine. And so I'm going to be spending the next several minutes sharing with you those events that are pivotal, those events that are critical, and those events that have had a major impact upon the church that we know today. It is not by any means exhaustive, and it is by no means inclusive of every facet of history that is worthy of our attention and consideration. So uh, I see several others have joined us since we have started, and I'm so delighted that you are here. Uh, there is a chat box uh, available, and I encourage you to and so I encourage you uh, to take advantage of that. Please try and save all of your questions uh, toward the end. I'll try my very, very best to answer as many questions as possible. Now, you will note that you are on mute and your video cameras or your webcams have been turned off so that you can concentrate on the material that I will be sharing with you and that I am so delighted to be able to bring to you. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to take you to our virtual classroom where I have prepared a special presentation to walk you through this material. And I am hopeful that you're going to enjoy this as much as I have enjoyed bringing it to you. Once we get in the virtual classroom, I'm going to say a bit more uh, about myself, my background, my own biography, so that you'll have a sense of who it is that is talking to you in this particular webinar. I also have a more in-depth online course on this topic that I have bundled with a very special discount price for this particular 
time of the year. And I am hopeful that as you watch and listen to all that I have to share with you, you will be encouraged to take advantage of that learning opportunity as well. So again, continue to come into the room. Thank you so much. Those of you who are joining us, even those that have uh, come in a bit late, I am Andy C. Luter. I'm your online instructor for this mini webinar. I am not going to take too much of your time today. I value your time and I so appreciate you taking a moment to share with us. And so this will not be the 90 minute, two hour uh, typical webinars that you are perhaps accustomed to. It is much shorter, somewhat abbreviated, but it is abbreviated for the purpose of compacting as much information into this time frame as possible, yet maintaining your attention and at the same time, respecting your time. So give me a moment. Let's go to my virtual classroom as I share with you this mini webinar on church history. So friends, let's get started on this mini Bible webinar. I'm sure you are as anxious to get started as I am. And so uh, let me start with your permission with just a word about myself. I was born in New York, actually Brooklyn, New York, St. John Hospital. That was uh, over 60 years ago. I grew up on Long Island. I'm a product of Long Island Lutheran High School. And after high school, I went to Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio, where I uh, acquired a triple major in communications, religion, and in African-American studies. After Oberlin, I was accepted at Harvard Divinity School. I did three years there and completed my Master of Divinity degree. Uh, from there, I went into the work world, and several years later, I went on to uh, United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio, where I secured an earned doctoral degree in 1994. Over the last several years, I've been able to create 60 online courses. I am the president of the New Life School of Theology, which is an online Bible college specializing in ministry degrees. I'm currently pastoring both on Long Island and here in New York City. I'm the proud father of two and the grandfather of six. Now, I have a very simple purpose that I want to achieve in this mini Bible webinar. And it is to provide you, the student, with a general picture of the journey of the church over the course of the last 2,000 years with the hope that it will give you a greater appreciation of where God has brought the church from. Now, I want to begin here uh, and declare that the New Testament church was founded upon the teachings that was communicated by Jesus during the time that he was on earth. However, the establishment of the church was performed by the followers of Jesus who took his teachings and spread those teachings throughout the world. Now, oftentimes you hear it said that the church was started by Jesus. Jesus throughout his life was a Jew, a practicing Jew, a rabbi, a teacher, but the organization of the church came from the disciples of Jesus. And I make this a distinction uh, because I wanted to be clear that the New Testament church is an outbreak of disciples that followed Jesus, took his teachings literally to the world. So I label this struggling to survive. The first 300 years of the church was filled with persecution, starting with the persecution by Emperor Nero back in Rome. He extended his arm all the way back to the Middle East and persecuted early Christians. It ended with the Diocletian persecution, which took place in 285 AD. Now, this was at the time when the church was outlawed by the Roman Empire. Religio illicitia is the Latin term that was attached to the church, meaning that it was not to be tolerated. It was uh, illicit or illegal. However, with the arrival of Constantine in the year 312 AD, the church goes from being outlawed to becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire. Why? Because Constantine 
converted to Christianity and his conversion included his adoption of Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire over which he reigned. Now, uh, some scholars argue that it was the appeal of the oneness, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, this oneness that really appealed to Constantine and caused him to adopt Christianity as not only his religion, but the religion of the empire as well. It is said that as he stood outside the gate of Rome, preparing to do battle with Rome, to take Rome and the throne of Rome, he saw a cross in the sky and heard a voice that said, conquer in this sign or in this symbol. In any event, what we do know is that Constantine uh, took on Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. Now, that brings us to the early ecumenical councils. And let me say here at the outset that uh, this is not a comprehensive uh, survey of church history. I'm trying to give you some highlights. Uh, I do have a course that goes f into far more depth and I do hope that as a result of you taking this uh, mini webinar, you will be encouraged to take that course as well. From 325 AD to the end of the 6th century, the church holds a number of early church councils to decide upon the major theological issues of the day. Now, some of those issues included items like the official language of the church. What would be the official language of the church? Would it be Greek that they spoke in the East, or would it be Latin, which was spoken in the West? What would be the official books of the Bible? Now, we're familiar with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but other competing books for canonization include the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of James, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Mary. And so this council uh, began the process by which the church would decide what books would be included in the Bible and what, what books would be excluded from the Bible. There was also a discussion of the nature of Jesus Christ. Was he human? Was he divine? The Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD uh, made the determination. It's called hyperstatic union, that Jesus was both God and man at the same time. What would be the headquarters of the church? Would the church be headquartered in Rome in the West or would it be headquartered in the east of the city that would be known as Constantinople? There were 21 of these early ecumenical councils uh, starting in 325 AD. And the last one took place as recently as the 1600s. Now, once Constantine moved uh, his headquarters, the headquarters of his empire from Rome, to Constantinople, the city of Rome becomes targeted by barbarian tribes to the north who repeatedly attacked the city. Friends, eventually Rome would fall and in the vacuum left in its absence, Islam would rise and replace Roman Christianity as the dominant religion in the area. This would take place over the next 100 to 150 years and we'll see a very interesting development here. Now, that brings us to Islam would attempt to spread into Europe, but would be halted by Charles Martel, the king of the Franks. Later, his grandson, Charlemagne, would rise to power and establish the Holy Roman Empire. Now, this Holy Roman Empire was primarily a European institution. I don't want to confuse that with the Holy Roman Church or the Roman Catholic Church. These are two distinct entities. This is more political, whereas the Roman Catholic Church was indeed religious. By the end of the first millennium, this would be the year 1000, Christianity would dominate virtually every area of the Western world. In the year 1049, Pope Urban of the Roman Catholic Church would call for Christians in Europe to unite and march on the Holy Land in an effort to retake the territories that had been lost after the fall of Rome. You remember that in the uh, 6th century, Rome falls, Islam rises, and for the next 200 to 300 years, uh, uh, the area, the territory, the geography, the land that had belonged to the Christians now falls into the hands of 
of uh, Islam. And so the Crusades was an effort to retake that territory. Eventually, however, these campaigns would fail, but not before setting the stage for a Renaissance era that would take place in Europe. Now, this Renaissance sought to recapture the glory of the early Greek and Roman civilizations. That brings us to the Renaissance itself. I have no doubt heard of names like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael. They lived during a period of time called the Renaissance, which was, as I stated earlier, was Europe's attempt to regain the glory of the ancient Greek and Roman civilizations. This is one of the high points of Western civilization. Upon the wall of the University of Wittenberg, marked theses or complaints or observations, thus launching the Protestant Reformation in Germany. Now, the Reformation would take many forms, including the likes of a John Calvin, John Knox, Ulrich Zwingli, and, the, and even the King of England, who was Henry VIII. Let me say here that an antecedent to Martin Luther worthy of mentioning is that of John Wycliffe, called the morning star of the Reformation. He lived about 100 years prior to Martin Luther, but many of the teachings and many of the items that Martin Luther would later teach and support had originally been introduced by John Wycliffe. That brings us to the Age of Enlightenment. I want to go back to the Renaissance era. That's when Western Western civilization began to accept the idea that truth could only be arrived at with evidence that supported its claim. Now, the more technical term here is epistemology. John Locke, Voltaire, Rousseau were the major contributors to this era, which placed a major hardship on Christianity. Now, in response to the Age of Enlightenment, Christianity was rescued by two great revival movements in America. These movements showcased the preaching and ministry of men like Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, George Whitfield, and George Grandison Finney. The movement also gave rise to para-Christian groups like the Mormons and the Jehovah Witness. In the case of the Mormons, there was a section of upstate New York that was called the Burned Over District. This is where the early pioneers of the Mormon movement first got their start. It was called the Burned Over or the Scorched Over Territory because there were so many revivals, uh, religious fervor and fire that took place in upstate New York until it took on this nickname. Of course, early pioneers of the Mormon movement would move west, finally ending up in Utah, and that's how that para group uh, ended up there. Uh, there was a, a group called the Millerites that was named after a gentleman called Miller that would become the uh, historical birthing of what we now know to be the Jehovah Witness movement. It was an apocalyptic group that predicted the end of the world. I do believe that the first year that was announced was 1844. It was believed that all who was a part of uh, the Miller Church movement would ascend up into heaven all at one time. Of course, this did not take place. And of course, Jehovah Witness have been predicting the end of the world ever since the mid 1800s. That brings me to the black church in America. Now, the birth of the black church in America is the result of two waves that were distantly related to the great revival movements that were going on almost simultaneously. Uh, that would be the Baptists and the Methodist denominations came into existence in the 18th century with people like George Lyle and Richard Allen. Let me begin with the uh, Black Baptist Church. First, George Lyle uh, is the first black man to have been ordained a preacher 
in America. Uh, that was done by the Wood River Baptist Association. What is very, very interesting is that early black preachers was used to preach to white people because of the lack of white preachers that were available. So you have names like Black Harry and Harry Hoosier. Uh, even Richard Allen was an early black preacher that was associated with Francis Asbury. Going back to uh, George Lyle, uh, the first black Baptist church in this country is in 1770. It was called the First African Baptist Episcopal Church of Silver Bluff, South Carolina. Uh, I argue that the original intent of the Baptist Church was to be hierarchical and to have an Episcopal government. But because of political tensions that existed at the time with Great Britain, uh, Baptists in general in this country, white Baptists went in a different direction and black Baptists tended to follow suit and avoid and reject the idea of a hierarchy. In the case of Richard Allen, he is the founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and uh, that is black Methodism in this country. And so that first wave would have been both black, Baptist, and Methodist. Uh, there was a saying at one time that said that if you weren't Baptist or Methodist, somebody had been messing with your religion. Uh, that brings us to a second wave of churches that came in the early 20th century with the likes of a William Seymour and the Pentecostal movement. Now, William Joseph Seymour uh, went to a school called the Apostolic Faith School in Houston, Texas. There he had an experience of uh, learning about the Holy Ghost with the evidence. Remember, epistemology, the evidence of speaking in tongues. He relocates to Los Angeles, California. Uh, preachers initially at a Nazarene church is put out of that church because of the teaching and the stance that he takes in his sermon uh, moves to Bonnie Bray Street rapidly outgrows the facility there on Bonnie Bray Street and ends up in a barn that interestingly enough had been owned by the first African Methodist Episcopal Church and there he launches a revival that would last from 1906 to 1914, a eight-year period that revival was known as the Azusa Street Revival Movement. And most Pentecostal and holiness and even apostolic denominations and reformations of today are uh, can trace their history back to the Azusa Street Revival Movement. Well, friends, that takes up just about all of my time, and I certainly want to thank you for yours. Now, it very well may be that you have uh, questions regarding this mini webinar that I have shared with you, and uh, if you want to contact me, my number is 614-778. 6028-614-778-6028. I'm also available via email at bishopacl at mindspring.com. Bishopacl at mindspring.com. I put together a very, very special collection of courses that goes into deeper depth on all of the information and the material that I've been sharing for the last several minutes. The URL link is here on the screen. It's bishop.teachable.com forward slash P as in Peter forward slash again fall bundle. I ask and encourage you, even invite you to take advantage of that link and take a look at what we have available. I have so enjoyed uh, sharing with you in my virtual classroom today. I'm going to go back to my office. There are some closing comments and remarks that I'd like to make before I release you from this mini webinar. Well, friends, that takes up just about all of my time, and I certainly want to thank you for yours. I've returned here to my office uh, and have exited my virtual classroom. I want to thank you for sharing with me these last several minutes. But before you go, 
please give me an opportunity to share with you what I believe is a tremendous learning experience and opportunity that I am anxious to make available to you. Now, you have listened to me for these last several minutes talk about the highlights of church history, primarily from the perspective of Western civilization, but there is so much more that I would like to share with you. And I have put together four courses, church history, the first 500 years, church history, the second 500 years, church history, the third 500 years, and then uh, the last 500 years, the most recent years of church history. Now, normally these courses are made available uh, independently as a standalone item. But for you that have joined us today, I have bundled all four of these courses, uh, provided a deep discount, and I am making them available to you as a seasonal special. I'm hopeful that you will take advantage. There are links that should be available to you, and uh, nothing would please me more than, the ha than to have an opportunity to continue the conversation that we've been having for the last several minutes in a more comprehensive and perhaps even a more exhaustive kind of way. I have taken time to assemble some of the most well-informed scholars, not only from around the country, but friends from literally around the world as they talk about items like the Council of Nicaea, the Mon but the Monophysites, uh, the Iconoclast, uh, Charlemagne, the Crusades, the Protestant Reformation, all of the items that I made mention of during my presentation is dealt with in a far more in-depth manner. And I want to share that with you. So do take action. There is a deep discount that is made available to you. I am so grateful that you have watched this mini webinar, but I want to say to you that this is only the beginning. And if you have enjoyed what you have heard, what you have experienced, and you want more, I am anxious to, you, to tell you that more is available. So use the links, enroll in these bundled courses for installments, first 500, second 500, third 500, fourth 500 for a period of 2,000 years as some of the most brilliant minds and able scholars from around the world share with you their views, their perspectives on the major events that have taken place within the corridors of church history over the last 2,000 years. Listen, I am convinced that you're going to enjoy what has been put together, especially for you. So again, listen, I am Andy C. Luter. I am so grateful that you have taken this time to spend with me today. I will be doing a number of other mini webinars of this type and sort in the future. So be on the lookout uh, in terms of your emails. Be on the lookout in terms of direct text. I want to send to you future invitations to be a part of my many webinars in the future. Some of them have to do with theology. Some of them have to do with doctrine. A good deal of them have to do with history. I'm very excited about some of the biblical biographies and the biographies of major thinkers and contributors to the Christian enterprise over these last 2000 years. I have put together over the last several years, some 60 online courses, that's right, some 60 online courses where I have taken what I have been privileged and honored to learn in some of the most prestigious institutions in the world, and I'm sharing it with you in a way that you will have retention and it will remain with you after the learning event itself. So do take advantage of that, and I so Look forward to seeing you in one of these future mini webinars in the future, but more importantly, in my virtual classroom for one of my online courses. Listen, friends, we'll see you real soon.